There's something magical about photography, about how it creates likenesses um, in the world. The camera essentially is a machine that magically makes replicas of things that it sees. But I would argue in this respect photography shares very little with the basic logic of what we would call simulation and simulacrum. Um, the goal of simulation is to emulate experience, um, the experience of a thing, as closely as possible. But it's only in the realm of the visual that photography actually uh, comes close to any form of imitation. All the other kind of properties connected with things in themselves are not really present uh, within the still image. So at its heart, simulation is imitation by a diff different mechanism. So in other words, it's trying to do something um, that we feel as though we're experiencing the same thing, but it is simulated. It's an attempt to be indis uh, indistinguishable from phenomena. Um, simulation is therefore firmly situated within the realm of illusion, and illusion is one of the basic constituents of magic. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how magic and photography come together. So today it would seem that we occupy a world saturated by simulations, a world where our direct and indirect experiences are configured in many different ways. It's a world replete with magical illusions, where spaces are virtual and where products are rented, not owned and where we document our lives as we want them to appear to others. The consequence of this is that we have only minimal contact with what we might, what might be described as lived real reality. Instead, reality is, is mediated, it's deferred through a series of simulated experiences. Uh, the evolution of this process has resulted in screens, so this screen, uh, moving from being a simulation to becoming a thing in itself. Screens are no longer an interface for our physical, uh, between our physical reaction, uh, our physical self and technology. They are physical, they are a physical site of interaction itself, providing direct experience of a simulated real. They are in effect a reflective plane of illusion and magic. So where does photography fit within a world of simulation. Um, photography facilitates a dimension within which we, uh, in which what we photograph, the things that we look at and photograph, emerge from what seems like an impossible frame. Why is it even there in the first instance? The entire process of photography operates as a kind of magical illusion then. And like all magic, the, its intrigue resides in the palpable sense of impossibility that photographs manage to render visible to us. In other words, they appear to be an impossible outcome of something that we see. Uh, while we can uh, readily accept that we're looking at a photograph, we also readily accept a disconnected relationship between it and the thing it shows us. And in acknowledging this perceived gap between a photograph and that which has been photographed, we tend not to link our perception of reality as being intrinsically formulated through non-reality, the non-reality that photographs present to us. This sleight of hand obfuscates the question of how appearance then appears to us. So when looking at photographs we try to understand them by what they show and by trying to work out what they mean. But in the same, uh, but in seeking out meanings, photography is understood in the same way that an audience understands a magic trick. What we know becomes uh, comes to us um, through misdirection, through illusion, and through appearance. What we see is only part of what is happening. Perhaps a more useful question then might be to ask how photography photographs and photography appears to appear. How is it that appearances formulate themselves in the way that they do? 
In her project Finders Keepers, Dutch photographer Laura Chen works with images that she sources from undeveloped films purchased from eBay um, and from car boot sales. This is essentially a process of appropriation, one which has intrinsically uncertain outcomes. Chen never knows what, if anything, is on the films that she acquires. When she develops the films, someone else's reality becomes transformed into her practice. Unexpected outcomes are intrinsically part of her process, but they're not directly evident in the work itself, although they are an important component of how the work evolves. Through revealing hidden images, we can interpret Chen's work as unlocking the unconscious of the film. Chen discloses a latent content of films that she acquires, and up until then, the f uh, up until when the films are processed and printed, they hold within them a certain potential. Were they to remain undeveloped, then these images would be in a state of endless postponement and postponing uh, their contact with live reality. Chen admits that she will never know what the original photographs were about, or to understand the details of what they show, or why they are originally taken. But this is not important to what she is creating, because she makes appearances fill in a void, forcing a wider question as to where are images. Finders Keepers is constructed from many different photographs, uh, the work is an act of restaging then, uh, transposing new memories onto previously unknown or forgotten ones. And this is precisely how we usually access the unconscious, where the unconscious is understood in its Lacanian sense of being an alternative scene. It's an accompaniment to our direct experience. In their forgotten, unpurchased and undeveloped state, Chen's films were still images of sorts but they remained in a potential, or we might say today, virtual state, until the point at which they were used within Chen's project. But at the point of realisation they become something entirely different, meaning quite literally emanated from where it wasn't before. What seems magical is how we can now see what we should not have been able to see. We shouldn't have been able to see those images. They were previously undeveloped, hidden. Um, this work performs a trick on us then, expressing what is almost impossible, lost images that are recovered into something new. Although nothing is perfectly realised, what we see is an impossible reality that also depicts fragments of what was once hidden. It seems all photographs re retain this delicate coexistence with the hidden, unprocessed and unlooked at. So what makes photographs so complex is how they render visible that which should not be possible to see. Therefore, in some way, all photographs teach us how to see and set out the coordinates for our visual understanding. Which is to say that they provide the basic schema for how we encounter the visual world. It's not that photographs replace our sense of the real. Rather, we can understand photographs as organising the real world into something we can then recognise. This means they do not represent the world to us, instead the world is seen as being the setting for an infinite number of photographs. And we encounter these every day now. The point here is that photography should not be understood through the relationship it supposedly has with the subjects that it depicts. There can be no relationship between the photograph and the object it depicts. As I outlined in the introduction, we can understand photography as existing in a gap that forever separates a photograph from what it shows. Inherently lacking the objects they depict, photographs are part of the antinomy of perception that is directly structured through photography. Articulating the gap between seen object and seen photograph, photography informs much of how we now see. And from this perspective, Photographs do not directly show us the world, or things in the world, instead they stage the world in a particular way so that we can see it. As looking is always in some way constructed, then photography provides the terms by which we look. 
Developing this line, we can dismiss the idea that meaning is somehow something that resides behind photographs, that we can find meaning behind a photograph. In fact, the opposite is true. Since photographs exist everywhere, all around us, they have become meaning in itself. In other words, the meaning and purpose of lived real reality is simply to be photographed. This is not because of vanity or self-promotion. It is because perception operates through appearance, and today appearances are largely photographic. Thus, everything that is happening is somehow an image waiting to be photographically seen. And this produces a kind of negative force. Photographs are quite literally obstacles that prevent us from seeing the real of reality.